Um, music was always around us. Our father's music was always around us. So it's like it was just like inborn, really, you know, because from, as I said, from when I was very young, it was always around, you know. So I think that it was picked up even subconsciously in our minds before we consciously realized that, yes, this is our father's music and this is what it's doing out there and things like that. Living in Antigua for a few years, you start to soak up the local radio, the local artists. I had a friend called Richard Curry, who can only be described as a white Syrian Jamaican. And he owned a great record company in Jamaica called Federal Records. And I went to see him and started work with two of his artists. One was called Pluto, who we later had a hit in England with, with that, that thing there. And Ernie Smith, who was also a Rastafarian. But Bob Marley and the way this was never mentioned to one night, Ernie Smith said to me, you're coming with me. You're gonna come and see Bob. He picked me up and we went there. I mean, it must have, it was like a, a hangar or a shed or a, a factory. It was about 2000 people. It was hot, steaming, sultry, and the air was full of smoke. You were contact high within 10 minutes, no problem at all. But what was amazing to me was the fact I was the only white person in the whole place. And then Bob Marley came on. And for two, two and a half hours, he performed, flowed, did everything. And when you're in the music business, there are always what you can class as ultimate gigs, real landmark gigs. And this was one of them. It was a very, very, very special night. The next day when we were having lunch, Ernie was there and Richard Curry was there and I said, I saw Bob Marley last night, fantastic. I said, is he available to sign? Slowly, Richard looked up from his food and said, he signed with that friend of yours, Blackwell. In 1972, Chris Blackwell signed the Whalers to his island label. The result, Catch a Fire, released in 1973, was a breakthrough album, triggering international recognition of the Whalers. For the first time, a reggae band had access to the best recording facilities. Before the Whalers signed to Ireland, it was considered that reggae sold only on singles and on cheap compilation albums. I think it'll, I think it'll continue honestly forever, in a sense. I think that he will be, his music will be around forever. Mozart's music, Mozart's still influencing people. That was 400 years ago. Somebody at Island Records called me up and said, Bob Marley and the Whalers are playing tonight, do you want to come? And I went, yeah, absolutely. And then I thought about it and I thought, no, I don't want to go. It's going to spoil the magic of that night. Because there, there are ultimate gigs and when, when you're in, you know, you go to gigs and some are good, some are bad, but there are ones that are so special, you never ever forget them. And I suppose in a way it's like eating your favorite box of chocolates. You don't, you know, you, you've got to know when to stop. And I didn't want to go and see a different show because that show in Jamaica that night in Kingston had been absolutely spectacular. He was going to be a superstar, whatever. You know, he, he had that in him to go forth and tell the world, you know. He educated himself to educate others. Well, I assess him as the third world superstar of the day in the field of entertainment. He was not just a Jamaican singer. He was an international singer because the message that he carried was the message of third world people all over the world. In doing so, of course, he helped to put Jamaican music on the map internationally. Well, people believe that Bob was a prophet. I know Bob as a messenger. I won't stress his head about he's a prophet. I know that he's a messenger. His understanding was God owns everybody's conscience, you see. When a person is alone, they aren't alone. And that is what people have to answer for on the day of reckoning, you know. So I don't think he would be as quarter if he didn't have that understanding. 
all his aim, his desire was in music, nothing else, you know, nothing else really that he was interested in beside, you know, music. That was his main thing. What I really know is reggae music. He might play other music or interested in other music, mm. but this is the one that I really know. Because you see, that's how he put the message out to the mm. whole world, you know. So he put out his message in song yes. that everybody should come together as one, yeah. live as one, and you know, nothing better than that. How yeah. good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's Bob Eamon's his desire, to see everybody live in peace and harmony in this world. Because that's what let the world go round, you know, love. He's the one who teaches us everything that we know. Singing and playing and things like that, because as his children, we followed his footsteps, you know, as an artist. I mean, it's also an inborn conception too, because all of our family is musician. Our grandmother is a musician. You know, our uncle is musician, our auntie is musician. All of the family is musician. One particular song that stands out in my mind is a song called Small Axe. In this song, he's saying, um, if you are a big tree, then I'm a small axe and I'm ready sharp to cut you down. This was, you know, um, with reference to um, taking on the system. So if you are the big tree, you're a small The one thing I did like about Bob Marley, apart from the music, was his taste in women. Now, if as a Rastafarian, he treated his women as second-class citizens, I, I, I was not a party to that. But I did see him turn up in various places on various TV shows and various concerts with some of the best-looking women. Now, as a Rastafarian, he obviously believed that he, you know, he was in a relationship and they should bear his children. Hence, the Marley estate, the Marley family, the many children of Bob Marley, all with different mothers. But boy, did he have some good-looking girlfriends. I think there's some parts of the world where it's frowned upon, uh, but if you look as um, every child that you bring into this world as a blessing, then he was blessed. I think people um, put, put in a bit too much pressure on the gentleman. Um, he love woman, man. It's not uncommon for um, anyone growing up in Jamaica to have kids with different women. And of course, if, you, <laughs> if you're an artist like Bob, the great Bob, of course, there are going to be more options. I believe that in Jamaica, even the next guy in the band that played the bass, they call him Family Man, yeah? Because he have many children, you see? So, being Bob Marley you now, and you love woman, and as a Rasta, them don't believe in conception, like uh, probably a bash and stuff like that, you know? And from a woman get pregnant, you know, if you have a baby. <laughs> so, so, you have a lot of children, you know what I mean? See, so you're trying to ask me if Bob Marley was a bedroom bully, but I don't think so. A lot of guys love it, a lot of girls love that as well, you know what I mean? For Bob Marley was an handsome man, so, you know what I mean? No woman would want to be with an handsome man. You know, see. <laughs> Marley was becoming revered as a mystic and prophet. His influence was noted by politicians. When Bob was approached by the then Prime Minister Michael Manley, offering to stage a free concert, he agreed. I said you Throughout the island, civil war raged between rival political factions. And now that Bob had become an international celebrity, politicians sought to use him as a pawn in their power struggles. On the night of 25th of November, 1976, assassins crept into his mansion and opened fire. Bob, along with Rita and his manager, Don Taylor, were among those hit. As a manager in the music business, the most remarkable event that happened in Bob Marley's career to me is when his manager 
took the bullet. If we've seen all the movies about the security people around the American president. Would you take the bullet? He apparently, if I can remember rightly, he was at home or in his manager's house and some assassin came in to shoot him and Don Taylor, his manager, leant across him and took the bullet. Now, in Jamaica, there's always been terrible violence to do with politics and elections. I think it was at the time of one of the elections and both parties tried to claim him as their own so that they could get their, his followers to, to vote for their party. And it was a political situation. They, somebody obviously felt it's better to have him off the scene and then he couldn't be used by other party. Well, being a manager, you think about that and think, my acts are quite nice, but I don't think I'm going to take the bullet for them. There was a politician thing going on in Jamaica at the time, you know, trying to pull him on this side and this side, you know, what party. But because he was on God's side, you know, they never agree with that. So they tried to frighten him. Bob Marley was shot by a politician, you know. Yeah? To be a president in Jamaica, you have to be corrupted. Any kind of politician, you have to be corrupted. I don't think Bob Marley would want to be a president because politics is too corrupted. Whether or not Bob Marley would have made a good politician is difficult to say. I think he might have declined to be a politician but I think he would have made a great politician's advisor. If he was an MP, the hearing he would be positive, you know? Anyone would tell you if he was an MP, you know? But the politician, very dangerous, you know? Politics is life and death, you know? Very selfish. How oh, could a man who fight against politics become a politician, you see? But I was more like a revolutionarist. Yeah, Bob Marley was like the vice for Rasta because the things what Rasta was saying in Jamaica, Bob Marley could say it for them through the music. And the way Jamaica is, you have one television station at those days. Yeah, and most people listen to the radio or you buy the paper. Some people couldn't afford the paper. So a lot of people listen to the music. That's why you have reggae music more time. So we're political in our way because people can get the message where they want to hear through the music, you see? So, Bob music is like a vice Rasta because everything time you hear Bob talk, Bob talk about Rastafari, you know, because it was nothing else than a Rasta, you see? Ghetto youth tired of the constant political infighting banded together in a mammoth reggae concert for peace. It ended with Prime Minister Michael Manley and opposition leader Edward Sayaga on stage shaking hands in an appeal for peace. The man responsible for it all, they say, was Bob Marley. Bob, you've been labeled a powerful political individual. How do you regard that? Well, I mean, yeah, we was like, we try for my career to bring peace, knowing that we really can't solve the problem with a war, you know. It doesn't really solve a problem. You know, feel like really killing someone. But whose problem am I going to solve when I kill someone? You know what I mean? So I figure the peace is the best thing. And that's why I go ahead and work with it, because it was a spiritual thing that happened. But isn't what you need some sort of social, legislative change? The economic conditions are bad. You have a lot of people who are unemployed. What's really going to happen now is that we don't really want the island to change. We want the world to change. And his music is how he gets his message across. Rastafarianism is very popular in Jamaica, yet in Canada and the United States it has a bad reputation. People are associated with drugs and the trafficking of marijuana and violence, police yeah, arrest. Yeah, man, them crucified Christ, remember? Christ was a Christian and them crucified Christ, same is not a, what no, it is. No, but let's go back to the facts. People have been arrested and the Rastafarians in Toronto, for example, have but a I mean, very bad reputation. When I, I mean, you know, I would say, I wouldn't say that the Rastafarians have a bad reputation. I would say people give the Rastafarians bad reputation because the Rastafarians, I mean, you know, I mean, all of these things happening before the Rastafarians even start coming to Canada anyway around here. But, but the things that are very obvious are things like the way you look, Right? To most people who are very conservative in dress, you look quite strange. 
plus the fact that you advocate smoking yeah, marijuana. Yeah, the thing is, I'll show you this now. Could they tell God that it's not legal? No, but you're... They couldn't tell God that it's not legal. You have a very strong religious belief, but other people don't necessarily share that. And what they see are the obvious things. And isn't it, in fact, true that many Jamaican people get involved in the trafficking of marijuana and therefore get the bad reputation associated with...